Hello, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, we are going to talk about cardiac structure. Now, let's take general concepts of the heart. The heart is located in the chest cavity. So this is our chest cavity, that's where we can find the heart. But the heart has specific place in which we can find it. That is the middle mediastinum. So here is what we call the middle mediastinum. At the middle mediastinum, the heart is being found between the two lungs. So this is our lungs, the right and then the left lung. So between the two lungs, we find the heart. And this is our diaphragm. So the heart is actually lying on top of the diaphragm. At the anterior part, it didn't appear here. At the anterior part, we find the sternum. That is the breastbone. And then at the posterior part, we find the esophagus and then the trachea. Now, all these things that I've been mentioning, the lungs, the diaphragm, the sternum, the esophagus, the trachea, they all come together and form the anatomical relationship of the heart. So, as a medical student, sometimes they can ask you, mention the anatomical relationship of the heart. This is how we are going to go about. Now, the heart extends from the second rib and then it ends at the feet intercostal space. So basically, the base starts from the second rib and then the apex ends at the feet intercostal space. Now, when you take the heart, two thirds of, third of the heart has been shifted to the left side, to the middle line plane of the thorax. So now, this is generally, or the general concept of the heart where it locates and other stuff. Now, let's take a good look at the heart. This is the longitudinal section of the heart. When you take the longitudinal section of the heart, you can see four main cavities, which are very important. We have the atrias and then the ventricles. So we have the atria, the two atria, and then the two ventricles. This these cavities form the heart. So we say the heart is a four-chambered organ. So these are the cavities that come together to form the heart. Two atria and then two ventricles. Now, when you take the atrium, that is the right atrium and then the left atrium. The same thing applies to here, the right ventricle and then the left ventricle. I mention it like that because the heart basically has two divisions. That is the left side and then the right side. I drew the diagram with two different colors because here is having a blue color and here is having a red color. The blue color means that here there is circulation of deoxygenated blood at the heart and here the circulation of oxygenated blood so for you to take note of that i made the oxygenated blood to be red and then the oxygenated blood to be this color which is the blue so anything that i'll be talking about the blue side you have to know that we are talking about the oxygenated blood circulation and then at the right side we are talking about oxygenated blood circulation now if you take the right atrium if you take the right atrium this is the right atrium we have certain components basically the the the, the atrias they are the cavities that receive blood from all parts of the body to the heart and then the ventricles these ventricles they also send or pump blood from the heart to all parts of the body. So that is the difference between them. Now, the right atrium, when you take it, it has certain components or certain blood vessels that brings blood to the heart or to the right atrium for it to send it to the right ventricle and then pump it to the lungs for the lungs to fill it with oxygen 
and then send back to the heart so that the heart can send it to all parts of the body. Now, if you take the right atrium, we have three main blood vessels that bring deoxygenated blood to the right atrium. The first one is the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava is a vein that takes blood from the head, the neck, and then the upper limbs to the right atrium. And we have the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava also takes blood from the lower limbs, from the abdomen, and then send it back to the heart, into the right atrium. Now, we have the third vein, which is the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is, an, is, a, is, is a vein that takes deoxygenated blood from the heart itself. That means after the coronary circulation, the coronary circulation, all the deoxygenated blood come together and then through the coronary sinus, it gets to the right atrium so that the heart can send it to the lungs for it to fill it with oxygen. Now, these are the three main blood vessels that bring blood to the heart so that we can fill that blood with oxygen. Now, in the right atrium, we, uh, we also have another component over here. These are very group of cells. These components, they are group of cells in the heart. Basically, the heart has um, two main group of cells. It has other cells, but we are talking about cells that are very important. They are two. The first one, they are... The first one are the myocytes, and then the second ones are the peacemaker cell. They are the peacemaker cells. The peace, the myocyte cells, they are the cells that undergo contraction and then send, pump the blood from the heart to all part of the body. And if it is the atrium, it pump the blood from the atrium to the ventricle. Now, the peacemaker cells, they are the cells that generate electrical signals so that we can transmit it through the, the myocyte and then get them excited and then pump the blood, a contract and then pump the blood to, the, um, to other parts of the body that, or, the, or the places that we need them. Now, the myocyte cells, we have a very group of cells over here that are called the S, SA node or the sinoatrial node. So this side, beneath the superior vena cava, we have a group of cells which are called the sinoatrial node. And then they are the peacemaker cells. We make emphasis on them when we are talking about the electrical conduction of the heart. Now, af after that, we have a component over here, a certain hole over here. This hole is called the foramen ova. This hole is called the foramen ova. The foramen ova, what it does is it permits let me draw this one here. So let's assume this is our right atrium, our left atrium, our right ventricle, our left ventricle. Now, if you take the right atrium and then the right ventricle, in the fetus, the right atrium and then the left atrium, they communicate. They communicate through the foramen ova. So we have a certain hole here that connects the right atrium to the left atrium. Because in the filters, they don't have developed 
glands that can fill the blood with oxygen. So they get the oxygenation of the blood from the placenta. So after the placenta oxygenates the blood, the blood passes through the right side of the heart and then through the foramen ova, it gets to the left atrium and then the left atrium sends it to all parts of the body so that we, we will undergo the systemic circulation and all the tissues in the future can get blood that contains oxygen. Now, after few weeks, few weeks after birth, this foramen ova closes because already we have the lungs to undergo that function and also we don't have the placenta after birth so that the, the, the function of the placenta which was filling the blood with oxygen is being replaced by the lungs and then this foramen ova or what will close and then when it closes it will leave a depression which is called the which is called the fossa ovalis. So the fossa ovalis, they are the depressions that are being left over after the foramen ova has been closed. Now, after that, when the blood gets to the atrium, the right atrium, the right atrium undergo contraction. And when the right atrium contracts, it will pump the blood to the ventricle. Now, let me mention something over here. The two atria doesn't communicate in an adult. In an adult, these two atria doesn't communicate. The same thing applies to the two ventricles. They also doesn't communicate because of the presence of the interatrial septum. The interatrial septum is actually located at this part, but because of the iota and then the pulmonary trunk, we cannot see it. But the interventricular septum, this is the interventricular septum. So this separates the right from the left, so that the blood in here cannot what mix. Now, after that, the blood in the right atrium move to the right ventricle so when the blood get to the right ventricle the right ventricle will also undergo contraction and when it contracts it will pump the blood from the ventricle to the pulmonary trunk now before the blood can get in here it passes through a certain barrier over here. The barrier opens when the, when the atrium contracts, the barriers open. And then the barrier, when it opens, permits the flow of the blood to the ventricle. And this is called valve. Now, we have one here and we have one here. They are atrial ventricular valve. It's about that's to treat the atrium from the ventricle. So we call it atrioventricular valve. Okay, now this AV valve, in short, this AV valve, what it does it, it permits the the, the it permits one way flow of blood that means blood from the atrium flows in only one direction that is from the atrium to the ventricle blood from the ventricle cannot get to the atrium because of how the valve has been structured now the work of the valve the work of the valve is being maintained by certain components in the ventricle and what are they these are the papillary muscles papillary muscles the papillary muscles they are three in the right atrium and then two in the left atrium but in certain patients it can differ but basically they are three in here and then two 
in here. Now, what the papillary muscles does is, when the ventricle contracts, it also contracts. And when it contracts, we have certain fibrous cord that hold the valve to the papillary muscles. And this is called the cordae tendinae. This cordae tendinae, when the papillary muscle contracts, it increases the tension in the cordae tendinae. And then it holds the, 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 the valve, that is the leaflet of the valve, in position. So that when the ventricle contracts, the pressure in here won't push the valve backwards and create a space for the blood to get into the atrium. So the functioning of the valve can be maintained when we have the papillary muscles. So in a situation in which we find como in, the, in myocardial infarction, where there is uh, there's no function of the papillary muscles, the valve over here, their function cannot be maintained because when there's contraction, the papillary muscles are not there to also contract to increase the tension of the cordae tendinae to hold the valve in position and thereby causes backflow of blood from the ventricle into the atrium. Now, the same thing applies to the left. When the blood gets to the left, it passes through the valve over there. Now, after it passes through the valve, this valve also closes when we are pumping the blood from the ventricle to the aorta. Now, the right side of the valve is called the right atrioventricular valve. That is right AV valve. Or it is called the tricuspid valve. It has the name tri tricuspid valve because it is made up of three cuspid. It is made up of three cuspids. Now, so when you take it, it is like this. One cuspid, two, and then the three. Now let's come to the left side. The left side, it has the name, the left atria, atrioventricular valve. And it has a second, which is the bicuspid the bicuspid valve. That means it's also made up of two cuspid, one and two. And has a third name, which is the mitral valve. This is what we normally use in our daily activities, the mitral valve. So, this valve, the right side, it has, it is called the right AV valve, and then the tricuspid valve, and then the left, that is the bicuspid valve, the left AV valve, or the mitral valve. Now, after the contraction of the ventricles, the blood moves to the, to the pulmonary trunk at the right side, and then at the left side, it moves to the aorta. When it is moving, or when it is entering the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, they also enter into certain valves. Certain valve. These are called the semilunar valves. They are called the semilunar valves. Now, let me write it here. The semilunar semi -lunar valve. Now, these semilunar valves, they are two. So if you want to know them, the pul pulmonary one, we say pulmonary And then bring the general name semi lunar valve. And then the the iota one, we, we call it the iotic. And then bring the general name semi lunar valve. 
So this valve also opens when this the ventricle contract this valve opens and then it permits the flow of blood from the ventricle to the aorta they also ensure one-way movement of blood that means blood can move from the ventricle to the aorta but cannot move from the aorta to the ventricle because the valves are made to ensure one-way movement now this open and then the closure of the valve is as a result of change in pressures between the cavities now let's take something like this this is our atria and this is our ventricle now we have our av valve here that is this one and then this one our av valves here when the pressure in the atrium is higher than the pressure in the ventricle the av valve opens so here when the atrium pressure is high than the ventricle the av valve will open and then it permits the flow and then when the pressure in the ventricle it's also higher than the pressure in the atrium the av valve will close that means that in the process of the contraction to pump to pump the blood from the ventricles to the aorta and the pulmonary trunk what happens is the pressure in here becomes higher than the atria and then it causes the valve to close so this is how these two valve opens and then close now let's talk about the we have certain muscles in here they are very important now it is good to know too in the in the right in the atria we have this mouse that is the pectinate the pectinate muscles the pectinate muscles what the, what they do is they increases the surface area of the atria to permit it to get more to receive more blood now at the ventricle we have the trabeculi canine this tra trabeculi canine they also locate they are being found in the ventricles and what they do is they also increase the surface area of the ventricles so that we can get higher uh, uh, output now they also have specific or uh, one function that is very important what they do is they prevent co co the co collapsing of the valve sorry they prevent the collapsing of the ventricles when they undergo contraction you see that when the ventricle contract it closes and, and then they come back so what this muscle does is after contraction it helps it to also regain its volume again so it doesn't permit it to collapse completely so that is the function of the trabeculi canine now let's come to the arteries now we have this to be a pulmonary trunk So the pulmonary trunk, when we send the blood from the ventricle, the right ventricle, it enters the pulmonary trunk. And then from the pulmonary trunk, it gets to the pulmonary arteries. So we have our left pulmonary artery and then our right pulmonary artery. So these arteries lead to the lungs. And then when the lung it reaches the lungs, the lungs also fill them with oxygen. That is the deoxygenated blood move through the pulmonary arteries. And then when it reaches the lungs, the lungs fill them with oxygen. So after the, 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 the lung um, has filled the blood with oxygen, they will come back from the lungs through the pulmonary veins. 
So this is our, these two are our left pulmonary vein and these two are our right pulmonary vein. And then these two will bring the blood back into the left atrium. And then the left atrium will send the blood to the left ventricle. And then the left ventricle will pump the blood through the aortic semilunar valve to the aorta and then to the systemic circulation. Now, when you take the aorta, the aorta actually has three main divisions. It has the ascending part. The ascending part, we call it the ascending aorta. So from this side to this side, we call it the ascending aorta. Now, the curved side, which is the aortic arch, I always represent it by a aortic arch. And then the last point, which is the descending one, the one coming down, that is the descending aorta. Now, the descending aorta, the descending aorta is also divided into two. It has two divisions. That's the thoracic descending aorta and then abdominal descending aorta. So this is our descending aorta. If this is our descending aorta, we have the thoracic one and we have the abdominal one. So we have our thoracic and then abdominal descending aorta. Now, there's one thing that we should take note of. At the aortic arch, as I represented it with A, it gives rise to three arteries which are very important. So as I represented it with A, the aortic arch gives rise to three arteries. Now, these arteries are first, the brachiocephalic artery. This is the brachiocephalic artery. This is, so I, I represented it with, with B, here we see, and then the S, for you to remember, so easy. So the B is the brachiocephalic artery, the C is common carotid artery, and then the S is the subclavian artery. Now, if you take the, 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 the heart, or if you take the aortic arch, we can basically divide it like this. And then when I, when I divide it like this, we have here closer to the left, and then here closer to the right. So we say these arteries, they are at the left side. So we call it common left common carotid artery and then the left subclavian artery. But this, this is basically for the right. And then this subclavian artery, it also gives rise to two branches of arteries. And these two branches of arteries, they are called the common carotid artery and the subclavian artery. They are the right side, the right artery for the left common carotid artery and then the left subclavian artery. So we say at the right side, the brachiocephalic artery give branches to um, right common carotid artery and then right subclavian artery. Whilst the left side, the, we have the left common carotid artery and then the left subclavian artery. Now, when you take the wall of the heart, let me magnify the wall of the heart over here so that we can work on that. This is the wall of the heart. Now, we have three layers. The first layer, the first layer is the one lining inside. The second layer is the muzzle here, and we have the outer layer. Now, if you take the first layer, which is the inner layer, it is called the endocardium. The endocardium, what it does is it's made up of smooth muscles and it permits smooth flow of blood through the heart. And also what it does is it reduces the friction that the blood may cause between the, the, the wall of the heart and the blood. Now, it has one important function, which is it 
prevents blood clotting. Now, it prevents the circulation of the blood from clotting inside the heart because when the heart get uh, when the blood get clot in the heart it has so many complications one when the, when blood clots in the heart during the, the the pumping of the blood we pump alongside with the blood and then when it reaches the small arteries it gets blocked and then it cannot permit the flow of blood through that artery and because of that it can cause is ischemic stroke in the in the brain and also we can get um, 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 it can affect the lungs also too so for that one this endocardium it prevents the blood circulation in the heart from getting clot now for for the middle one which is the myocardium The myocardium, what it does is, it also, this is the myocardium. It contracts, it gets excited and then contracts. And when it contracts, it permits the, 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 the ventricles to also contract and then pump the blood to all part of the body that you want. And at the atrium, when the myocardium contracts, it pumps blood to the ventricles. So for the myocardium, its main function is, it undergo contraction and then we have the last one which is the outermost one which is the epicardium the epicardium with the outermost one that protects the heart okay now we have the heart in a certain sac like structure this is called the pericardium So the heart is being embedded in this pericardium and then the pericardium it has two main layers which are the fibrous layer and then the serous layer. Now the serous layer also has two main layers which are the viscera layer and then the pareta layer. Now, when you take the pericardium with the uh, fibrous layer, the fibrous layer is the outermost layer, the serous layer is the innermost layer. And then in the innermost layer, we have two layers too, which are the visceral layer and then the pareta layer. Now, this is our, peric our pericardium. The outermost layer, which is the fibrous, is this one. The outermost one that we have. And this outermost layer, what it does is it protects the heart. It protects the heart from trauma. And two, it anchors the heart. Now, Let's come to the, the visceral layer of the serous um, pericardium. The visceral layer of the serous pericardium is the one that is being attached to the heart itself. So for that one, we call it, it's another name we want to call the one, the epicardium. So the visceral layer of the serous pericardium is called the epicardium. So the epicardium over here, It has another name, which is the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. Now, the pareta layer, it is also the innermost layer that line the fibrous layer. So you see, this is the fibrous layer, and you have another black lining over there. So that one is what we call the pareta layer. Pareta layer of the serous peric pericardium. Now, this pareta layer, together with the visceral layer, what they do is they undergo secretion of serous fluid. And this serous fluid that they secrete, they secrete it 
inside the cavity being created in the serous layer between the epicardium and then the parietal the parietal layer this is what we call the this is what, what we call the um, epicardium cavity so this is what we call the pericardium cavity so in the pericardium cavity in here the parietal layer together with the visceral layer what they do is they secrete serous fluid and this fluid will lubricate this cavity and prevent um, um, the heart from getting or um, causing friction when it expands okay so this is the function of the of the of the sac like structure which is the pericardium that protects the heart now basically this is what we should know or what as a medical student we should know about the heart with the cells with the parts with the cavities its location its anatomical relationship they are very very important so this brings us to the end of today's lesson if you find this video interesting like this video comment share and then lastly subscribe to the channel and wait for other videos as i upload them thank you for staying with us my name is michael